Welcome to Real Talk with LaShondra. This is a series about entrepreneurship, leadership, and success I have learned throughout my journey in the construction industry. I'm LaShondra McCurious, and I have been working in all of these spaces for over 15 years now. I will be sharing my thoughts and experiences about all the topics and also having conversations with amazing guests who navigate those spaces on a daily basis. Today we're going to be talking about diversity in the construction industry. Now being a black woman in construction and being a business owner has not been easy. This particular industry is very homogenous. And I can say that there's been plenty of times when I've entered into the room and there was no one that looked like me, except if I brought my husband with me. He's black too. That is not easy. And I think that there is a huge opportunity for diversity in this industry. It's a very homogenous industry. And I think that with the current racial undertones and overtones that are going on today, I think this is a discussion worth having. So I'm excited to introduce my first guest, who has also had an amazing story to share. Stefan Montgomery is an accomplished leader in the transportation industry with over 33 years of experience. Working his way from frontline operations, which is a fancy word for came from the bottom and now he's here, to an executive level. Stefan is considered a results-oriented and innovative change agent and thought leader. Now I have about a whole other page about this man's accolades that I'm not gonna read today because it's just too much. He, he know he got it. <laughs> he know he knows who he is and what he's done. So if you guys are interested in hearing more about everything that he's done, go to his LinkedIn page because it's all there. So let's get started. So I shared a little bit about my journey and how I got started in the industry in my first episode. It wasn't easy. It was a challenge every day. But here I am 10 years later being the president of a successful multi-million dollar firm and respected in the industry for the quality and service that we provide. I also started from the bottom now I'm here. So let's talk about your path to success. Well, Lissandra, thank you for having me on. And um, I really appreciate that introduction. And um, if people have an opportunity, I would encourage them to go to my LinkedIn profile. But I like what you said, like I started from the bottom now I'm here. Uh, I forget what song that's from, but I know that's from some song. That's Drake. Come on now. Okay. Started from the bottom, now we're here. That's true. That's true. That's true. You know, I'm a Jay-Z fan. So if people hear me. Here we go. If people hear me, um, I'm from New York, so if you hear an accent, it's my New York accent. So I I couldn't tell that you were from New York. You couldn't? Well, a lot of people can. I couldn't tell you was from New York. Yeah, well, you know. You know how we do in New York. So, But I've been out here for the past three years, loving California and just love my life out here. So you asked me what was my path to success. Um, I started as a cleaner and worked my way up to vice president before I retired. After that, I ran a couple companies. Um, but it wasn't easy. Um, I had a lot of obstacles along my way. Um, people didn't necessarily uh, want to help me. Um, but there were people who saw things in me that I didn't see in myself. And sometimes you have to trust yourself and trust other people. One of the stories I like to tell is that um, I was going to be a locomotive engineer. That's the guy who drives the trains. And I was in class. Okay. And uh, when I was in class, um, the instructors were talking to me about being an instructor. I'm like, well, how can I be an instructor? I didn't get out of class yet, right? But I guess they saw something in me because I was working with them and helping them. And then I got out of class and like four months later, they called me to be an instructor. I'm like, how can I be an instructor? I just got here, like, you know. Uh, they go, no, we've seen some things in you. I said, okay, somebody's gonna call you. So this person that called me was well-respected in the industry. Uh, 
you know, if this guy gave you a call, you that 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 gave you a check, you know, like that verified. That was it. I made it. Yeah, yeah. So he called me. I I remember saying, Ray, I I don't think I'm ready. He goes, Steph, you're ready. You're ready. So one thing led to another. Put in for the interview. Little did people know, uh, it was a teaching assignment. So I was going to be a training instructor. Little did people know, uh, because of my religious background, I was teaching in my religion mm-hmm. every week like three times, twice a week. So I was already an instructor. And so even though the other people have years of experience, my teaching instructor got me the job. So really quick, I want to ask you, were you surprised that that teaching knowledge or that sort of that aura about you came out and, you know, others took notice? Um, Because it sounds like, you know, that wasn't necessarily the direction that you were going. No, it wasn't. That really wasn't the direction I was going. I just... I didn't even see that in myself, right? I didn't know that I, I just, it was part of me just being me, right? And sometimes in life, people see things in you that you don't even see in yourself. Mm. And so they saw that in me. And I remember an old boss of mine, because prior to that I was a rail traffic controller, he said to me at the interview, after the interview, he said, you did excellent. I didn't know you had all this in you. He said, because if I had known this in you, I would have kept you. Mm. So... You know, people see things, but these people saw something in me. And when I got the job, I'll tell you honestly, I loved it. Mm. Like, I love being an instructor because the thing about being an instructor is uh, at the end of the day, everybody's going to like you because right. you help them build their career. Mm. Right? Interesting. Right? So that I love that. But, you know, as anything, to move up the ladder becomes more money, more responsibility. So quick question for you. Um, when you entered into that world, and you, you know, wanted to become an engineer. How many people look like you on that career path? So um, there was quite a few at that time because the company had been sued a couple years prior to that. Mm. Uh, it was called the Descent Decree. What would happen is at this agency, and I'll mention the agency because um, I don't work there anymore, uh, even though they sent me a nice pension check. Um, well, all right now. Cover your bases. <laughs> Cover your bases. Um, the Long Island Railroad had was sued, I think it was back in the 80s. Um, what, had, what, what happened was they were discriminating. So if two candidates came in, one was white, one was black, and they had the same qualifications, they let the white person go to a high-level job, a rail traffic controller, a conductor, maybe a locomotive engineer. The black person, they were sent to be a coach cleaner. Mm. So that's what happened. And so what happened was they had to now really think about uh, promoting uh, people of color. And so this had been, my first job was real traffic controller through the consent decree. Um, that was an interesting job because it was only 100, and, I think it was 110 people. Five people were African American. Wow. Only five. Because in that particular job, um, that was like a cushy job. You're a rail traffic controller. Nobody ever thinks, nobody even sees them. Mm. Um, they make a lot of money. I literally went from making $17,000 a year to $45,000 overnight. Big balling. Yes, yes. Back in the 80s. You're talking in the 80s, right? You're talking in the 80s. That's a, that was considered a lot of money. That would be like, you know, making $30,000 and going to 90, mm-hmm. you know, today. So back then that was a, that was a big thing. So. That occurred, um, and then I just kept, and people saw things in me. Mm-hmm. Um, and even some of the, in, when I became an instructor, I'll never forget a guy that I was um, I was working with. He said to me, you know, one day you're gonna be my boss. And I go, no way. He goes, yeah, one day you are. And this was just an average person. And I remember when I became his boss, the second day he came in my office, he said, I told you. So even he saw something in me. Mm-hmm. So for many years, I guess I didn't see it in me because I, I think and a lot has to do with who you're raised by, right? Mm. For me, my parents, when I gave them with an A, they would say, well, how come you get an A plus? So Sounds like they had very high standards, yeah. as, as they should. Right. And, and so for me, this was just me. I didn't think mm-hmm. anything different because my mother always said, 
you got to be the top at your field. So I have a question. So as you're going through this particular journey, and it seems like right away people are taking notice that you're special, that you have more to offer. Did you see the same type of opportunities happening for others that look like you? Yes and no. Explain that. Some people didn't have the same work ethic. Um, some people didn't know how to, they always fought. Um, they always thought everything was a racial issue. Mm. And many times it was, but sometimes it wasn't. It had to do about your work, your work ethic. Like you, you, you're not doing the job, so why are we gonna make it about race? Mm. Um, it still wasn't proportionate to a Caucasian, mm-hmm. right? So let's just say that in, let's just use, for example, a uh, class of conductors or engineers. Um, if we hired 40, maybe five of them would be of African American descent, maybe three of them would be women. So it wasn't. But it's also um, where I lived. I lived on Long Island. If you think about Long Island, Long Island is one of the most segregated places in the country. It used to be. Uh, if you go back to history of just it's 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 the history of the Long Island Levittown is that um, segregation law that came out um, that talked about building houses just for Caucasians. So when you talk about our history, they had a great start, right? And so it's very segregated there uh, on Long Island. Now, New York City's different. New York City is completely different, but Long Island is very segregated. And and the company I work for worked on Long Island. So it was interesting, you know? As I got older, I started to understand. But remember, when I got there, I was 20. What did I know? I ain't know nothing. You didn't know a damn thing. And here's the funny thing. I thought I knew everything. Of course, that's how it works. Yeah, but here's the the funny thing today. I think I know less today than I did at 20. Even though I'm more educated and more worldly. And the reason is, my world has expanded so much, it's impossible for me to know everything. I mean, real talk, now you know that you don't know. Right. And that is where the wisdom happens. That's right, that's right. So I hear you because I have a couple 20-something-year-olds that think they know everything trying to tell me about myself. Oh, I digress. Let me me keep on the subject. Okay. (sighs) Okay. So let's fast forward to 2020. Okay. And now looking – so you're in 2020 and you're looking back and you're looking at all the things that you've done, all the things that you've been able to accomplish, all the people that – helped you get there now that we are here now that pandora's box is open and eyes are open and there is a voice there is a movement for diversity what do you think needs to happen today in order to make diversity in our particular industry construction infrastructure and transportation how do we diversify I think we gotta stop thinking the way we think. Explain. Everybody has a bias, right? Everyone, all of us sitting in this room have a bias. We have a bias because we know what's been successful. So sometimes when hiring managers look at things, they look at what has been successful in the past and that's their model. Instead of looking at something different or getting to know people. A lot of time, a lot of things has to do with our culture and our background, right? Um, People are comfortable in their own culture. If they never go into another culture, they're not comfortable. They don't know what people know. They don't know how they work, how they live. Um, Knowing what I know now and all the people I've had working for me, you know, at one time I had 5,000 people working for me. So you know, know, that's a lot of culture, right? Yes. That's a lot of culture. But everybody does things differently. And so in our industry, just like you, I remember walking into the, uh, I think it's called the World Congress or the Building Congress in New York. Mm -hmm. 
There was 1,200 people in there. Deputy, governors, city officials. All the big wigs. All the big wigs. I counted seven people that were the same color of my skin. How did seven. that make you feel? It was a light bulb moment for me. Really? Yeah, and I'll tell you why. Because I always worked on the public side. I was working for a private firm at the time. Um, good firm. Um, pretty diverse firm. You know, for their French company, I'm going to name them, Sistra. Um, uh, good people that work there. Um, but when I was there, it was a light bulb moment for me because I realized that the skills they need in that industry, some of the some of the minorities don't have it, right? So if I'm a hiring manager, right, and I need to fill jobs, I go to where I can fill jobs, right? Some of our people don't know that, right? You don't hear people talking about in our culture, I wanna grow up and be an engineer. Why do you think that is? Because they don't know about it because their mother and fathers didn't know about it. Right. Right. Their people didn't know. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. So all the young people that I mentored, I tell them all, go to school to be an engineer. Mm -hmm. Right. Because if you go to school to be an engineer, that's why in our industry, you'll see 70 or 80 year old men still working. Right. Right. Because they're engineers mm -hmm. at this point in their career. They, they've built a lot of buildings, they're highways, they've built a lot of things. So now their reputation precedes them, right? Right. And so now they can walk into a room and demand the salary that they want because they've done, they have the experience. And to your point, um, you said something that I thought was really important that I think we miss because, you know, in this particular environment when we're asking for more diversity we're asking for inclusion but we're asking for it at a level where it typically can't happen you have to start from education so that point that you made was was extremely important because if individuals are moving through the education system and they're not aware of the different opportunities that are there through engineering through construction if they're not exposed to these particular opportunities by the time they get to the point where it's it's time i need a job i need a career now they're behind so in your position as someone that hires a lot of people you can no longer consider them as much as you want to diversify. Right. So you are not in a position of power to diversify at that level because you have to get a job done. Right. You have to get these trains running. Right. You have to get these construction projects going and you have to think about the safety of the individuals that are riding your transit system. Right. And so diversity becomes lower and lower and lower on your list of right. priorities right. based on the situation that's in front of you. What do you say to that? I, I agree I agree a hundred percent because you got a job to do. And if the workforce is not there, how do you fill it? Right? So it goes back to education. I, and I always think about this for a moment. My father said to me, go to the Long Island Railroad and get a job. He didn't say go get a career. He said go get a job. Now I fortunately, because of my work ethic and getting an education later, I got a career. Hmm. But that's not what he says. Today's parents tell their children, get a career. Get a job that you will enjoy doing for the rest of your life. A career that you will, that's not really work. Right. Our parents didn't do that. And why not? Because they had a job. And all they wanted me to do was get a better job than they did. Right. Right? Long Island Railroad was a great job. It turned into a career in transportation. I had no intention. I didn't even know what transportation was. Right? Right. Nobody, anybody who falls into transportation or construction, that's not really where they planned on going. Some people do. People who are engineers, yes, they usually want to go into construction, maybe go into mechanical engineering, but most people don't do not do that. That's interesting that you say that because I, I would agree with that point because since I've been in this industry, which has been, you know, well over 10 years, I recognized that as we are assisting on these projects, I just noticed that there just wasn't exposure for the professional side of these careers. And whenever these, you know, big contractors, you know, come into our into the the neighborhoods and want to, you know, build these big projects, what they were offering to the community 
wasn't the the thinking jobs it was the labor jobs right and I think that was one of the things that I recognized needed to change, um, you know, which is why back in 2015, we started Career Excellence Academy, right. which actually goes into underserved communities and exposes the individuals to professional jobs in construction, transportation, um, infrastructure that they never knew about. When you go along the freeway and you see the, these big huge projects you don't know that there's a beautiful office building where two to three hundred people are sitting there making things happen behind the scenes and so i think that having exposure is key yeah and i know that for me personally if i was to start my career with the wisdom that i have and the knowledge that i have now i would went to engineering school mm. right? that's what i would have done because there's nothing in the world that gets made or produced without an engineer. That's just the way the world works, right? right? These microphones, this table, these chairs we sat on were designed by an engineer. So that's a job for life. If you really think about it, it's a job for life. Well, I'm gonna take that point a little further and I'm gonna ask you a question. What's that? Um, you talked about this industry and engineering being a job for life. What do you think you want your legacy to be? Because that's really the life. You know, what are you going to leave behind so others can use what you've done, your success to be that building block to then do more? Well, one of the things that I, I want to do, um, I, I tease about this all the time, right? So, you know, number one, I'm, a, I'm from New York. I'm a Giants and Yankee fan, right? And Boo! So, yeah, okay, you can, you can, you know, you Californians can say whatever you want, but that's right. Okay, but Lakers all the way. Okay, but just Dodgers. Remem but just remember how many World Series we have, the Yankees. But I digress. Okay? That's because you cheat. Oh no, no, you, you're thinking of Boston and Houston. You're not thinking of Yankees. We're a one, number one class organization. But that we're not here to talk sports, okay? So, but I'm gonna let that slide. But go ahead. Okay, okay great. I tease and always say that when I retire, when I pass away from this earth, that I want my family to be able to rent out Yankee Stadium for my funeral. Why is that? Because I want to have touched so many people and helped so many people. And when I say help, not more so in, in some monetary way, but provided some type of wisdom to them or some kind of education that they didn't know about that goes, wow. I really never thought about that like that. Um, so that's my legacy. And how do I do that? Well, I do that by educating people. I do that by mentoring with people um, and mentoring them, having conversations. I don't mind having a conversation about my career, but it's not about what I have accomplished, it's what I'm doing now, right? And so, you know, I was just, as you know, I was the president of Compto, uh, that's over with. I'm working on some things now uh, that will I think revolutionized the construction and um, and transportation industry on the business on the business development side. Was it any any part of it that you kind of want to share? Because I think it's important for our listeners to know what you're doing next. I mean, you've had a full career in transportation. You've retired, you know, on top of your game, mm -hmm. you know, as a you know a CEO and vice president of a of large organization in transportation. So I think it would be interesting to know what is next for you. Well, um, I have in the last few years had my own company and I consult. So, you know, I go to companies and work for them, operational analysis, do some business development for them. But what I'm working on right now is um, automating business development. Business development right now, the way we do it is inefficient. And uh, we live in a world where information needs to be at your fingertips. Right, and in many places it's inefficient, it doesn't work. Um, so I'm putting a program together that will automate that and make it so that it will be at your fingertips. You'll know what the RFPs that are coming out, you'll know what companies are looking at them, we'll team you up with it. So what it does, it, it provides a service to big primes and contractors, uh, then it provides a service to small business. So this way, because there's plenty of money out there, but one of the things that happens is, that big prime contractors always say, well, I can't find anybody, right? Right. Right. They always say that, I can't find anybody. But there's plenty of people out there. Mm -hmm. But small businesses don't have the bandwidth or sometimes the money 
to invest in a business development person to go get them more work. Right. So what we're doing and we're automating it and making it affordable for everybody because there's enough because what it does it benefits the prime and it benefits the small business. Right. That's that's interesting because it sounds like through automation you are sort of eliminating a lot of the barriers to entry for a lot of businesses and I would assume that they're businesses of all colors. Yes. Yes. And that and that was a that was the so it's the it's the business side of me and it's also my nonprofit side. So I've married it because I worked, I, uh, besides the nonprofit I just was at, mm-hmm. I ran a nonprofit for a year. And so one of the things that on the nonprofit side is that you see these businesses struggling, right? Right. And they're coming to you for help, but sometimes you can't provide them the help because you're only one person. Right. And then you hear on the business side, I talk to people and they're like, I'll get calls and say, I'm looking for this type of company. I'm looking for a DBE company that's this. Mm-hmm. Now, I have an extensive database, so I've been able to help them find somebody. So essentially, you are duplicating yourself to be able yes. to. So your platform, it's like your brain, your personality, who you are, and how you see businesses connecting and networking because we already saw in that long ass bio that I had of yours <laughs> that you're considered a master connector right. which is amazing so now you're taking that and you're duplicating yourself through a platform so that you can help multiple people make the connections and have the networking ability that they wouldn't otherwise have because there's only one of you now I don't know how I feel about having multiple yous around you a whole lot Stefan you're a whole lot. Well, here's here's the thing. It's not it's it's going to be my business concept, but I'll have other people working with me who have a different personality because remember, part of diversity in a company is to have different people with different viewpoints, right? right? Like you surround yourself with a multitude of diverse people, right? JLM is known for that. Why? Because you have older people, you have younger people, you have all different races here. Why? Because you're trying to attract the best qualified people. Yes. I'm just going to follow your business model. It's been successful. It works. And and But even if you look at not your business model, but other companies, the ones that have diverse organizations do very well. I the would one, agree. The ones that don't have diverse organizations, they do okay, I'm not going to say, but they have a little problem. Right. And they have and I call they have some guilt with that too. Hey, listen, imitation is the best form of flattery. Right. So I'm 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 not mad at you. And I wanna see you succeed. You know, I wanna see you take your ideas, take your mind, take everything that you've done and take it to the next level. Because if if minorities, non minorities, veterans, women, if whoever if they can benefit and if they can grow their businesses and be better, then it's all worth it. Yeah. Because I think that we're entering into an age where it's not going to matter anymore. I mean, automation is taking off. And who cares what color the platform is? It could be blue, yellow, orange, green, purple. It doesn't matter. What matters is, are you delivering quality service? And can you continue keeping with that pace as industries change? Can you be flexible? Can you adjust? And that's really what it's about. And I think that's when the level, the, the, the playing field will be leveled yeah. for, for everyone to have a shot at success, regardless of what color you are. And I think diversity will naturally happen through that type of platform. So... I'm excited to see what's next. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm very and excited. And I want to make sure, since you are sort of using my design, I would expect at least 20%. Okay. At the very least. And if you become a billionaire, I would like to put in an order for a jet. Okay. Um, it has to be at least a 20-seater. I don't want one of those cheap little okay. Cessna things. Okay. I want a jet. And I would like, since your funeral is going to be at New York Yankee Stadium, right. I would like um, front seats behind you know, the um, pitcher, because, you know, when they hit them balls, there's a fence. Right. I want to be behind the fence. Okay. I don't want to be anywhere where the ball can, can get okay. me. Okay, okay. You All know, right. because it's already going to be tough walking in there. And I will be showing up with um, Dodger gear and Laker gear to your funeral. So I just want you to <laughs> know that already. Okay. Don't, no disrespect, 
Okay. You know, okay. I'm going to put some spec on your name. Okay. Uh, I, I'm glad you do that. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm glad you'll do that. All right. And I hey. may have a list of other things a little uh, bit later. Okay. All right. But I want to say one thing. I know we're getting ready to probably sign off. And um, if I can give your listeners just one word of advice. Yes, um, please. Um, grab yourself a mentor mm. if you can. Grab yourself a mentor. And sometimes, you know, a mentor doesn't look like you. A mentor could be a woman, a man any color because you want to learn skills that you don't have right one of the things I see people do is they get comfortable in the skills they have and they really over exaggerate those and the ones they don't have they don't fulfill those those skills or they don't work on them Mm -hmm. Um, I had a I had several mentors unfortunately one of my mentors passed away with COVID just recently oh my goodness I'm sorry to hear that yeah and one of the other mentors of mine who passed away about two years ago he probably was I I call him the uh, my father, my second father at the job, mm. because he talked to me in a way that nobody else could, right? Because you're hard-headed. Yeah, I was. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to lie. I'm <laughs> just teasing you. No, no, but you, but you, LaShondra, you're absolutely right, because at 34 years old, I had attained things that most 45- and 48-year-old men had not attained. So when you're 34, what do you act like? You act like you the... You know what? You the SH. IT, right. <laughs> right. And I was arrogant. I'm not going to lie to you. I was. But then I realized that I was seeing other people's career move up, and then I, I wasn't doing so. So I had plateaued. And so that's when this subject of emotional intelligence came in for me. And I go, wait a minute now. i got to get better here. All right? And I, and I looked into that. So I always say get a mentor. Make sure your emotional intelligence is in place. Because those are hard lessons for me. And my, my career did well. So don't think that I didn't have no bumps along the way. Please. Please. If you talk to some of the people I used to work for, they'd be like, oh, boy, we weren't sure about him. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Um, but it happens because it comes with growth and wisdom. Right. right. That's what it comes with. 34-year-old, you couldn't tell me anything. I thought I you was. You can't tell me nothing. You couldn't tell me nothing. I had a lot of people working for me. And, Drive a nice car, live in a big house, two beautiful children, a wife. You couldn't tell me anything. But I was just as arrogant. Um, and now I see what people were saying, right? And so as I got older and more wiser, I actually had to go back and apologize to some people, right? Because some of the things that I did. Um, but, you know, once again, it goes back to my father was a truck driver. Mm-hmm. My father never got to a management position. And many of us, when we get to those positions, there's no book written, oh, I should manage like this. Right. Yes. Right? Yes. And and I've made plenty of mistakes and blunders along the way. And I'll actually be talking about a lot of that in my next <laughs> podcast. Okay. Um, we're going to be talking about um, how to hire and retain talent. Um, but I, I want to say this in parting. Um, we've known each other for about how long, Stefan? About five years. About five years. Yeah, five years. It was in Dallas. We yeah. met you and your husband. Yeah. yeah, and I believe we were at a Compto event. Yeah, we were. Yeah. We were at the Compto. That was the, that was the year that they had the shooting. That's right. And we had just arrived like just a few days after the yeah. shooting happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, But I, I want to sort of share, you know, with my listeners, you know, what kind of person you are and how far you've come from that 34-year-old arrogant some of mama <laughs> when we were in Dallas we we were actually new to Compto which is surprising because we had already been in the game 6 years before we even knew Compto existed we didn't even know there was an LA chapter you know so we were a little you know in a bit in a bubble when it came to you know, these types of organizations. So we had an opportunity to, to go. We were invited to go. And I remember my husband and I were having breakfast. You know, we were just kind of sitting together. We didn't really know anybody. Um, and we're I'm actually pretty shy. You wouldn't think that, but right. I'm actually an introvert. Um, my husband is actually an extrovert, which you wouldn't know that either because he has a very stoic demeanor. So between the two of us, we probably look like, please don't come talk to me. <laughs> and that's exactly what was happening. Right. You know, no one was really approaching us and we weren't really integrating ourselves. But you were the first person to come over and say, hey, you know, how you guys doing? Um, and I noticed that you checked on us a few times when we were there. 
And there was just something about your energy, something about your spirit that both my husband and I connected to. And mm-hmm. we were so appreciative that you sort of wrapped our, your arms around us and sort of brought us in. And then you begin to introduce us to people. You know, you sat down, you listened, you asked about us, you wanted to know who we are, not just what we did and how we could help you or what you can get out of it. You could have cared less. But we felt like, wow, this guy, I don't know who he is, but he keeps coming up to us and asking us questions and introducing us to people. He's it's that's weird, but we like it, you know, and and as time went on, we ran into each other at other events. And it was almost like like a like a long lost cousin that you would see all the time. That's the feeling, you know, that we got. And I remember um you know, talking, you know, to you about L.A. And, and Long Beach and, you know, the different places and, you know, why you should come here. Because in, in actuality, I had an ulterior motive. I don't know. Well, you guys don't know this, but I'm and me alone is the reason that Stefan is actually here <laughs> in California and in L.A. area um, is because I wanted more of that. And there was nothing arrogant about this man. He was nothing but love, consideration, and that's who we wanted to surround ourselves around. Mm-hmm. You know, so um, I'm happy that you made the change. Oh, me you too. You know, it's, it's. I'm sure plenty of people who hear this podcast probably go, I'm happy you made the change too. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, um, you know, and so you're like family. Yeah, no, you I, know? Pre- and I appreciate I, you. Yeah, and I feel like, you know, we will have a long lasting relationship and I do believe you know because you you're gonna go first not me you, you're gonna go first I'll be at your funeral yeah, you right, don't right. need to be at my funeral no, I, I, and I'm okay with that because I'm, I'm only 25 right I'm a little older than that plus a few but yeah. I don't get older than 25 <laughs> um you know but hopefully we're all old and decrepit yes when well, it when it well, does that's happen the, that's the goal that's the yes. goal is that we're all old and decrepit and um where do old people go on one of those beaches, Palm Beach, or they go to Florida or wherever they go, whatever they do? Um, but you know, the new the new sixty or seventy is like being fifty now. There you, you know? go. There Everybody's you go. different, but uh, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you tremendously for coming and spending time with me. I mean, it's always wonderful hearing about your story and listening to your New York accent. I love it. Um, and I can't thank you enough for your friendship and for how much you give not only to us, but to the community. I mean, you're actually a transplant here in L.A. And I find it very interesting that you are doing a lot more than people that are from here and were born here. You know, so so that just says something about you that is not just about New York. It's about everybody it's about humanity and we need more of that so Mm -hmm. keep doing what you're doing don't change keep growing keep learning and just know that we love you thank you thank you i appreciate it this is a series about entrepreneurship leadership and success that i have found in the construction industry If you want to hear more and you want to be a part of our community, follow us on LinkedIn and subscribe to our newsletter on our LinkedIn profile. If you want to share your thoughts after listening to this episode, feel free to drop a line in our LinkedIn podcast post. Thanks for listening and we will connect next month.